Emmy award-winning producer, Charles Walkner on Hollywood, Silicon Valley, the future of content, and what it's like to pitch a big idea to Dwayne The Rock Johnson. All right, all right, all right. Hey ho, let's go. Hello, my legendary friends. Man, am I ever glad you're joining us today for this episode of Legends and Losers. We have a stunning guest, a, a guy who um, kind of has a life or a job or a career um, like a lot of kids do, dream about, you know, daddy, daddy, mommy, mommy. When I grow up, I want to make movies. I want to make TV shows. Um, I, I want to be creative, right? I want to go to Hollywood. Well, that's our guest today, um, Charles Wagner. And he, he um, we have a fantastic conversation. I think you're going to love it about the future of content. He tells a great story about uh, working with and pitching ideas to Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And he's also a guy that's lived his life kind of at the edge of uh, Hollywood and Silicon Valley and where technology and content intersect. And I think we have a fantastic dialogue. What makes the dialogue just that much better is uh, my dear friend uh, and business partner, Tom Schwab, joins us on this episode. And so Tom happened to be in town. And so I thought it'd be very cool to have him on. And so Tom Schwab, founder of interviewvalet.com, uh, the, uh, and my partner, these are the folks that book me on, uh, on podcasts. Um, so he joins us on the show and, uh, I think that makes it a little bit extra special. Now, speaking of extra special, uh, I want to start today by thanking you from the bottom of my heart. This is the one year anniversary of legends and losers. This week is our one year anniversary. And, um, you know, all I, all I have to say <laughs> all, haha. <laughs> Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, we had no idea if this was going to work. Uh, we had no idea if anybody would come on. We had no idea if anybody would listen, uh, would care. Uh, and most importantly, uh, we just didn't know if it was going to make a difference. And, you know, the more time I spend on our planet, the more I think that, um, you know, really what there is for us to do is to try to make the biggest difference possible we can in the world. That's what there is for us to do, right? Um, and so if there's a purpose of life, isn't that it? I mean, I, hey, I want to have a really good time too. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But along the way, you want to make a difference, right? You want to make a contribution. You want to make things better for the world and of course for yourself. But if we make things better for ourselves, and we bring the world with us or if we make things better for the world and the world takes us with us however you want to think about it right but the two are deeply connected but but clearly this motivation called uh can we make a difference and with legends and losers uh, as you well know um there's a very particular difference that we wanted to make which is in a world of inauthentic bullshit we wanted to see if it was possible to um you know break the veil of the talking points and and really have authentic conversations about what it really takes um you know to create to design a legendary business and a legendary life and the pain and suffering and the losery that goes with it and, and the hilarity that goes with it um and do it in a free range open authentic uh real way and so um there's a big part of me that is 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 surprised it worked and uh but however you think about it I'm just glad it worked. I'm glad you're with us. And I can't thank you enough for getting us to our year anniversary. All right. Um, Charles, he's the founder and president of his own production company, Hard 20. Uh, as I mentioned, he's the producer, uh, the executive producer of the reboot of Fear Factor with Ludacris on MTV. He produced the first ever uh, Apple commissioned um, uh, show for Apple TV, Planet of the Apps. And he won an Emmy Award for Jamie Oliver's Food Revolution. And here he is, Charles Wachter on Legends and Losers. So I just uh, raised financing for my own company with uh, Propagate Content, uh, which is owned by uh, Ben Silverman and uh, Howard Owens. Ben and those are big guys if I understand that right. Yeah, Ben used to be the co-chairman of NBC and Howard was the uh, president of National Geographic before they were pretty prolific producers. Ben produced Ugly Betty and Biggest Loser and The Office among 
The office. Yeah, the office. He goes to the Hall of Fame for the office, yeah. doesn't he, Charles? Yeah, well, the funny thing is, Ben actually created the whole, well, I like to think he does. He basically was one of the guys who pioneered the, the bringing of formats from the UK to America and then vice versa. That was the early wow. days. They were both WME agents. And as content started going global, Ben was in the first group that really realized that what's working in England is going to work in the States and vice versa and started really being the conduit. And that was what he built his business off of uh, his first business, which was Reveille, um, until before he went to NBC. The fascinating thing to me about The Office as a fan, I was a huge fan of the British show long before the American show came out. And when the news about the American show came out, like, came yeah. out, yeah. <laughs> I thought, oh, fuck. This, there's yeah. just no way they're going to be able to capture the writing, the chemistry, the magic, the insanity of Ricky Gervais. Like, there's just, yeah. I'm going to hate this. There's just no way. And of course, it went on to become legendary, and I loved it like you know millions of other people. Yeah. And so how does he figure out how to do that, how to take the essence of a show and re-implement it and not only not fuck it up, but really tune it into, in this case, the American market. Yeah, you know, I think uh, I think what would have been a disaster is, is was if somebody tried to um, impersonate Ricky Gervais, right? It's very it was an English style humility and sort of uh, insecurity, and rather than rather than try and impersonate, which could happen quite easily, I think. Steve Carell basically said, okay, I'm a mid-level manager who's been empowered in this small office. And how do I, how do I uh, let insecurity be my primary driving force, right? The need, you know, the, and I think he just backed right up to the basic sort of needed, the need to be liked, um, but also being drunk on power <laughs> for the first time as well, you know? And I think, um, I mean, I wasn't there back then. I was pretty young still, but, uh, but I think they did a really good job. Ben, like, uh, incredibly impressive. Uh, when I found out that that's who he was, I, I just thought, wow, Charles must be hooking up with a, a genius guy. Well, I tell you what, those guys, I'm, it's been like, since we started, it's been a whirlwind. You know, I'm a, a content producer. I create shows. I produce shows. Um, and I've actually made a bunch of shows for Ben, just made Apple's first TV series for him. And, you know, so, ben, I, can I stop you there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Planet of the Apps is Apple's first TV series, right? Yeah, well, uh, Carpool Karaoke and our show were greenlit right around the same time. Our show aired first. Uh, so, but yes, we were the first official purchase by Apple to make a TV series. So might I say, m most legendary of you there, Charles. Yes, it was, uh, <laughs> it was a very unique experience, um, as you can imagine. And not for how you'd expect, right? Like, I've done a bunch of shows uh, with brands like Walmart and Macy's and Saks Fifth Avenue and a bunch of other uh, brands. And usually they're pretty predictable. You know, you, a brand has a very heavy marketing filter. They make it very clear to you the goals of why you're in the show or why they're in the show. And, and you're constantly sort of like navigating the, the distance between a marketing goal and an entertainment goal. Right. And, it's challenging. Because the so brand is underwriting the content creation? Yeah. Yeah. If they're underwriting or a part of it, you got to protect the brand. You got to make sure you're on brand. And, uh, you know, some content, it's great. Like Fashion Star, we did for NBC, um, had Macy's and Saks Fifth Avenue and H&M. And, you know, Ben was a genius to be able to bring three separate brands onto one stage and people would create new clothes and then run it down a runway. And there'd be a live bidding war between these completely separate companies over the brand. And they were all different category spends. Obviously, Saks and H&M were really different, but it, it was really well merged, you know? Um, and with Apple, because it was a tech show, uh, you know, I sort of, we, you know, there was elements of expecting the same thing in terms of a heavy brand push. And um, what was interesting was Apple um, we're very much engaged in trying to make entertainment and to tell compelling stories and not, and not necessarily just communicate the brand that we all know very well. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting also because it's not a company that makes entertainment. So what I found, you know, with a big enterprise, like a big TV show, 
you're like building a city. It's like a, it's like you're building a city from the ground up. There's no one there. You sold a concept. It's either paper or tape or some talent, but there's nothing there. And then all of a sudden you need to, well, is it like some slides and some notes in a notebook of yours or <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes, you know, uh, you know, Ben, Ben and Howard sold that show to their credit. And, um, I think they were really well organized and thoughtful about the type of show to bring, uh, bring them. But, you know, you're building like an entire city from the ground up. And, yeah. and, and this city is communicating with a, with a capital city, which would be like the network, right? Like you've got your own city and your own people and you got to feed them and make sure they do their jobs and there's no war or crime. And <laughs> that's one of the cities, what you hope it to be and what you've told the capital city or your little city state's going to do. But the capital city is usually like designed to support this little city, right? It's actually there to make sure that you've got the money and the water and the oil, you know, all the things you need to just run this city, usually the network provides. And what was fascinating about working with big brands and certainly Apple is that they were building their city at the same time. And so things that usually- You mean are, their sort of media company inside Apple? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, um, we were- And they had not announced, Charles, sorry, sorry, I hate to interrupt you, but they had not announced this billion dollar commitment to- uh, creating their own content at that point, right? You were at the very front end of this whole thing for them. Yes, yeah, yeah. And we were, yes, um, you know, I, they were very um, Apple about the process. They said, we're making this show because this is the right show for us to uh, make right now. Uh, and and was the Planet of the Apps your idea, their idea, or where, where did it come from? Uh, it came from Will I Am, who was partnered, uh, mm -hmm. and Ben. Will I Am, Ben, and, and Howard Owens. They they got together um, and wanted to make a tech show that focused on software and specifically apps and the sort of the struggles to put together, um, to put that together, and then and then to bring in you know a sort of a human side to it. So they pitched that and um, with the talent and the concepts, I think uh, Apple was into it. And Charles, you said, you know, as you can imagine, and I can't even imagine that, right? <laughs> because you say it's like building a city. Like well, city. if you're all, if you're already got a city to benchmark that against, it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I'm going to do something just like this. But mm -hmm. when it's the first time, it's like, how do you get that communication going? Did they, did they lead the vision well, of what the city was going to look like? Did, was it collaborative? Uh, it was collaborative. Uh, they were uh, fantastic partners. I think they understood that we were making a TV show uh, mm -hmm. and that not just a piece of marketing. Um, uh, and, and they were very supportive of, uh, you know, of the concept and, and really gave us an enormous amount of resources considering the scope of the show um, in context of the scope of what is Apple. Um, where it got hard was just sort of figuring out the language to communicate to this capital city that usually does completely different stuff right so when we were like talking about the graphics package or the logos and by the way I was one of many producers I was not the only executive producer by any stretch of the imagination on the on the creation side so I don't want to take cr credit for that um, <laughs> but uh, you know when we had like graphics and and stuff and we'd be you know sending them to Apple we'd be liaisoning with the teams that oversee you know some of the most iconic graphic um, executions that Apple does like it went through their graphics thing and so there was an enormous amount of focus on that because they're so they're, did they treat it like it was a new iPod or something I mean I think we, we were in our box you know uh, thankfully but at the same time the things that were focused on by Apple are were things that don't necessarily are, are not always necessarily focused on by you know traditional um, things like the set the set you know we, we work with the live events team on designing the set because they're the part of Apple that physicalizes the Apple brand uh, in space so you know we had to sort of talk their language and and, and things like that and they're notoriously uh, you know maybe brand Nazis is, is too strong a word but I mean they are notoriously focused on their brand, their brand guidelines and, and the integrity of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what's that like for you as a creator trying to do your thing where you've got, you know, somebody who cares about their brand in a way that most companies don't um, as the client or the underwriter, so to speak. You know what, you know, it feels going into it that it would be 
challenging, difficult, but genuinely it was easier than t a typical show um, with Apple. They knew that they, uh, they, they allowed us and knew that um, the content um, was content and that they didn't actually um, work. You know, some, you know, some networks are incredibly aggressive uh, and produce your show from the network side, you know, where they're, they're actively trying to produce it themselves from the capital city. I love this metaphor. I just came up with it. <laughs> and by the way, it's we like, love Elvis. by the way, usually it's like, my, my leg might start twitching a little. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And by capital city, I mean like hunger games, Pan Am. <laughs> that's what I, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, no, they were, they were great. You know, they really were, they were not, um, they were, they were helpful. They gave us lots of resources. We were moving quickly, uh, in a completely new media environment. We didn't know how we'd be airing, um, when we started shooting and so you had no idea what environment they'd be delivering this no, content I think, on. I think they were figuring it out as well, you know, um, and I'm sure they're still figuring that out. Uh, so, and you know, we were privy to certain things and not other things and stuff. Um, so how did you think through that? Not knowing how the content was going to be consumed and aired and all the rest of that. Was that an extra challenge? Cause like there's some people like on the podcast, will listen to it audio. Some will do video, all the rest of that. And not even knowing how people are going to see it. Um, how do you deal with that? Well, um, we knew we were making a TV show and mm -hmm. pretty traditional one in certain respects. You know, uh, it was a business show uh, where people would be pitching their ideas, developing their ideas and trying to um, earn uh, venture capital towards their business. Shark tanky. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's, so there was, so we knew we were doing that uh, in terms of the balance between doc uh, stage, classic primetime spectacle, a more sophisticated kind of subdued storyline like that was where um, that was probably the most challenging to, to, to dial in because we certainly had enough footage to go full documentary. Um, and uh, but we also shot, you know, a, a pretty uh, spectacular stage at the same time. So sort of figuring out that was probably the toughest creative challenge, I think, on this show. Um, but you know, shows have beginning, middle, and ends, and and I think that there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, in many ways, traditional aspects to the show that um, were pretty straightforward. And Charles, do you think more companies or more tech companies are going to get involved in this uh, sort of new era of creating their own content? Yeah, you know, something that I think. I'm waiting for, right? So, so like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, media was a fire hose, there was a series of fire hoses. And if you were the one controlling the nozzle, um, you know, the high pressure nozzle, you, you know, Beverly Hills was built on it, Los Angeles was built on it, you know, that there were very few who controlled the keys to the entertainment kingdom. And now we're more like a sieve. There's like a thousand streams of content flying, you know, through a giant grate. And then the, the, the really the power players are the ones who own a large section of the great. So it's not one little, it's not one little nozzle of, you know, content, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, they own like this section of the great and they've got all of NBC, NBC universals channels, or they've got you all the YouTube content or Netflix is creating and licensing. And they've got all of these sort of uh, ways of reaching the consumer. And, um, What's happening is, is that content and brand are starting to really merge. You know, Red Bull TV is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking to more and more big brands about making content directly for them. And the business models are converging and the middle managers, which used to be, you know, the networks and as, you know, as ad, you know, buyers, uh, and, then, and then the advertising uh, industry as the middleman that kind of, you know, um, looked after us, the producers, that's kind of very strong, but there is a lot of uh, pressure on the outside from brands wanting con to connect directly with content. And the one missing piece is, is, is monetization from a viewer, right? Like, you know, Amazon already had a platform to monetize and calculate the value of a content spend against their traditional retail business. And that's why 
it was while at the time Amazon getting into content seemed like a leap. Um, it actually made a lot of sense because they were able to use content to bring people into their brand onto prime and they already had a way to monetize the attention of this content. Um, Is that one way Charles of saying if, if, if I'm Amazon, I create this premium content that you can only get through prime. I don't care about making money or monetizing the content in the way maybe MTV or NBC or a traditional media company would because what I really care about is selling the world prime because once I know I sell them prime, they're going to buy more diapers and shampoo and shit from me. Yeah. Yeah. It's about driving that membership cycle and the subscription cycle. You know, they are. So does that really fuck up the traditional guys? Because you know, Amazon is one of the most valuable businesses on planet earth. Obviously they make a tremendous amount of money. And so if they can, it, it, entertainment content is a lost leader to sell toothpaste and I don't have that giant uh, set of uh, product I could sell on the back end. Uh, I actually have to make money monetizing the content itself. Does that set up a giant problem for the traditional guys? Uh, it does. Uh, you know, the, there's three models, right? There's the loss leader marketing model. Um, and I would argue that Amazon's a hybrid between that and then the subscription model because they're actually making direct uh, income off people who are signing up to get the actual content and not just buying the toothpaste, right? Um, and then there's the ad-based model, which is traditional television. And the smart, I would say, not that I think everyone's figuring it out, but you know, the, the, the linear players like CBS are pushing valuable content onto their OTT app platforms like the CBS Digital launched the new Star Trek series, which was a very, you know, it's a very valuable piece of IP for CBS and they chose to use it to try and launch an HBO style over the top app. Um, and uh, there are, you know, obviously HBO uh, has been doing it for a while. They were one of the first players into the OTT space because it really modeled the way they did their subscription model on cable itself as well. And they never did advertising. So they were always, you know, subscription. So it made the most sense for them to. And remind us what OTT means. Yeah, that's like over the top okay. uh, content. So they've gone. It's, over it's the what top. you do after you do the FART and the IUD, isn't it, Charles? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I forgot. So with the with the content, it sounds like with the monetization, you're focusing more on long term value than short term. What can I monetize here? Is that the focus you're seeing people go to? On the content creator side or on the, on the distributors? Well, on your, on your content creator side. Are people well, looking at more of the long no. tail? Well, what's interesting is that all this money is flooding in from Netflix and the Amazons and the Hulus. They're, they're driving the price of uh, Sundance movies through the roof. Um, for a while, they were doing cost plus 30%. Usually our fees are somewhere in the range of 10% of the budget as a production company. And uh, Netflix in the beginning were coming in at 30% because they had to buy out the worldwide rights. And usually when you sell your rights domestically, you keep the international rights. Or in the early days you'd keep it, in the recent days you fight for it or don't get it. And guys like Ben and Howard who- You don't um, get the international rights? No, no. Now if you're a guy like Ben or Howard, which is one of the reasons why I was really excited to partner with them, you do because or you, you can because you've, got, you've grandfathered in deals at all the networks where you've sort of standardized your deal with that network. But if you're a new player, like me as a production entity and not just a producer, it's challenging to get any rights at all unless you're in a bidding war because the studios understand the value of the international market. They used to just be in the traditional television mar market about um, the... Um, the advertiser market because that's where they made all their money and they didn't really have a business engine to monetize licensing fees in Yugoslavia. You know, if you want to make the biggest loser there or you make your version of the office or what, whatever. And Ben was part of the early group of people who really crushed uh, and became legendary by monetizing arbitraging content between the domestic players who were spending all this money, millions of dollars. And then, and then they were going internationally and, and, and they weren't necessarily seeing the upside. Um, and that's converged now. And then what's flipped that all on its head is now that Netflix will buy up the whole world to begin with. So there is no long tail uh, in certain markets. Now, if you're in 
on the so script. Does that mean, I hate to interrupt you, Charles, but yeah. if you do a Netflix deal like that for your next big idea, whatever it is, yeah. have they essentially paid you everything that you are going to make on that show up front and there's no ongoing revenue for you? To, to be fair, I haven't d personally done a Netflix deal and I've heard many different deal structures. Um, you know, on the surface, yes, but obviously if you launch a very big show, they're going to have to relicense and rebuy subsequent episodes. And I think there are windows as well. They pre-negotiate. So success with Netflix, I believe, is they're ordering more, their windows are extending, you're renegotiating um, in that sense. But Got it. No, so when you did your deal, and if the specifics are inappropriate, then just kick me under the table, so to speak. But yeah. When you did your deal for the reboot of Real World with MTV, uh, did, did they just pay you everything up front and you gave up international? Or how, how did that deal work? Uh, the, you mean, I didn't do the Real World. Uh, excuse me, not Real World. Um, Fear Factor, for the yes. love of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Me me they, mental. They, you know what? They, they, Charles, the owner, the original I'm not that smart and I consume <laughs> a tremendous amount of scotch. Uh, that's good. Um, so uh, the way Fear Factor worked was MTV knew they wanted to reboot. Um, Chris McCarthy came in uh, and he had a lot of success at VH1 and Lobo and then basically take, took over the entire group at Viacom. And he reached out to the rights holder, which was Endemol, which is a big studio that makes Master Chef. Uh, and they made Home Edition and, and uh, they made Fear Factor. And he reached out and says, I want to remake this. Um, they held the rights, so they were essentially, Endemol held the rights, so they were essentially licensing Fear Factor from, um, uh, MTV was licensing it from Endemol, and Endemol kept the rights. So Endemol, the original version was on NBC, am I remembering that right? Yeah, on NBC, yeah. So NBC obviously didn't lock the thing down. End them all own the they, ongoing yeah, asset. Yeah, you know, generally there are windows after a show stops airing where the rights revert. It rarely, you know, certainly in the early days, I wouldn't, I don't know necessarily what it's like now, but in the early days, your rights would revert after the final season, after a certain amount of time. And if you had leverage, you could negotiate that more favorably or less favorably. But I know that the rights to Fear Factor um, were with End them all. Uh, Got it. So they were free... After yeah. the NBC deal ran its Actually, course to... You know, to be fair, because I wasn't part of the deal-making process, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if NBC saw a piece of that. Um, but I don't... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all, to be honest, but um, I'm not sure. So it sounds like the way deals are constructed is a little bit maybe all over the map, but, but changing. It's, you know, it's the Wild West. It really is. You know, that's what makes this show... That's what makes it so fun, is that there are no standardized deal templates... Things are shifting, uh, in, you know, sort of tectonically. I think in the same way when the cable market came uh, and really upended, you know, the big primetime broadcasters, we're seeing that again with YouTube, Facebook, Hulu, um, Apple, Netflix, Amazon, and then there are a bunch of sub uh, genres, sub uh, sub players in the digital space, and that are getting real VC money. Um, so. Um, it's every, every show is different. You know, if you go to a traditional broadcaster and it's a traditional deal and it's a traditional, you know, sales cycle, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty, it's in, in fact, it's very over, overly, uh, traditional, the deal making process, um, because everybody's been doing it, but, um, yeah, it's changing. It's changing. You know, every show is different. Every city you build is different. You know, I, I've been lucky in that I've done giant stunt shows and fashion and animation. And um, it's a fascinating time to be a content creator because you can really play in a lot of different verticals. It's not like 20 years ago where you had to be the sitcom guy or you had to be the, you know, daytime or the live guy or something. It's, it's, it's a, it's a really swift moving world. So with that, you know, you talked about the, the history of it, but where do you see it going? I mean, it, using your fire hose and sieve analysis uh, is, is the sieve getting bigger? I mean, Are there more holes in it? Or, I mean, and how do you uh, optimize that then? Te television and content is, you know, and uh, maybe we'll s stay away from movies for a while because that's a direct market kind of scenario. But there's always been big, aggressive systems that are monetizing and managing the money between the advertisers who have these huge marketing 
budgets and they need to spend that money to get attention, right? It's all about attention. And then there are guys like me and there's a lot of guys like me who are out there making stuff, trying to be like, watch Fear Factor, you know? Um, and what we're seeing is the two worlds like colliding more and more directly, right? Like we're talking directly to Apple who traditionally was just paying an advertising company to pay uh, a media spend on a network who then will hire and be the content arbiters of who they buy and what they make. And then, you know, it'll sort of the tributary would finally end up at a content creator or producer that is the world's collapsing. And I think, you know, there's a world where, you know, Tim Cook said that, you know, apps are the future of TV. And I think what he meant by that, because uh, that was all, um, was uh, that there is going to be a direct relationship between, I create a piece of content, a unit of entertainment that I can directly monetize with the consumer and they can pay me and, and I can, and I can, you know, I don't have to sort of go, the money doesn't have to flow all the way around through these sort of. Cause it's direct between Apple and you. Yeah. Yeah. And then ultimately direct between the consumer and the content creator. We see it on YouTube, right? What's also interesting is like on YouTube, it's all about direct market, right? It's like they make it and they get paid for every view through this Google AdSense marketplace. And, um, and the problem is, is that they have no budget to go premium or self market. So viral is the only way you can get to the top. And the problem is, and certainly they get paid very well to do that by brands who want to use the influencers audiences, but there's a whole other part of content, which is big premium, you know, in my world, fear factor, American gladiators, big Apple shows, you know, walking dead, you know, game of Thrones shows that people have to see. Um, and those two worlds don't meet, you know, a YouTuber can't throw together game of Thrones. Um, and those are extreme, polls but they're sort of they define like the it's not like it's not sort of going like this until it touches what's happening is is um the premium market is moving into these over-the-top distribution channels that were reserved primarily for people you know on youtube but there's been a lot of challenges at youtube getting those content to creators to create content that isn't ephemeral right that kind of isn't by necessity uh, short-lived. Yeah, and it, I don't know, you tell me, who, who's the creator of um, Game of Thrones? Forgive me for not knowing. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Somebody, Somebody Google it. Yeah. I've only watched every single episode, but yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, those kinds of things are not my thing, so I, I'm, I feel like the only person. I, I, when it comes to Game of Thrones, I'm like you. I'm just, I just enjoy watching it, so. <laughs> yeah. But, um, if you're the creators of Game of Thrones, is there any part, or, or, or listen, you know, when you think about rebooting a fear factor, is there any part of you where you go, fuck regular distribution, I just want to go direct, like a podcast would, or like a yeah. YouTube, make this a YouTube show? So I mean, I mean, is there, or is, I guess my question is, will we see a Game of Thrones-like popular set of shows? So. So there's a few things. Yeah. So the answer is yes, we've thought about it. And yes, I thought about it. My particular example is I made a small but fun show for TBS called King of the Nerds. And we had a rabid following. Um, and we did three seasons. And when the regime changed there, which is often the demise of shows that um, uh, are successful, but not necessarily the new person's success, uh, we were like, well, let's, let's go. We've got, you know, well over a million viewers. I think we were doing 1.2 in the demo, which was quite good. And we were like, let's make it. And they're going to come watch it. Um, and we started to get into rights challenges and ownership challenges. And, and I don't think we made it very far, but you know, uh, Louis CK did it with going direct to his fan base instead of, through, of an HBO special. He charged five bucks and you could And he did it not only with a special, if I'm not mistaken, I seem to remember he did it with uh, an over the top on um, Ticketmaster selling tickets to a tour once. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's once you have a, you know, the thing about shows is the shows they're buying are the shows that self market. And if you're at the point now where your success self markets itself and you have a way to go direct to consumer, if you're able to maintain that success, you're going to actually see a lot of upside. I haven't seen anybody 
do you, I can't think of an example of someone going, you know, sort of, if it were books, it's like the self-published route, like leaving, leaving a traditional uh, marketer and, and distribution network to go on your own and do it. I, we, I did a show with The Rock and I was always like, why don't we just make a movie for like $2 million? It's like, we've got The Rock in it, you know? And like, he would own the whole thing and probably crush because everything he does is, you know, amazing. So is it the dollars that really stop that then? The cost of the production? Yeah, you start to go into a more traditional like movie financing role where all the risk is on the, um, the you know, all the risk is before you know what the return is going to be, right? Like with TV, as soon as, you know, our budgets get big, you know, 10, 20, 30 million dollar TV shows and they uh, know, they're, they're pre-built business models, right? They know that if they can get some window of ratings, um, and they're usually pretty conservative. They know they're going to be able to sell the ad slots. They're no, it's already pre-sold at the upfronts, you know, months before the show airs, just based on the promise of the show and the talent. And so there's, so the money's there, right? When I get hired or when I, we sell a show, you go when the money's there and when it's, and, and the money's already been pre-sold in many ways, sometimes around the world. With movies, you know, look at Blade Runner. I think it was 300 million uh, to make and market that movie. And they did like 30 million this weekend. And that's just a write-off, right? It's a disaster, yeah, I right? I mean, it's an intergalactic disaster. Ha ha. Yeah. And I like that director. You know, I think he did a great job on Arrival. So, and I, you know, so it's less risk. You know, I think TV uh, is now starting to get some of the artistic creative kudos uh, that was once only reserved for film, mostly because people have been making killer content. Um, you know, I'm loving Mindhunter right now on Netflix. But, um, but still, it's much less risk. And, and you know, if you, if you hit a big show, you know, like at Warner Brothers, uh, the second biggest, most valuable thing they own in the TV space behind Friends is The Bachelor. You know, hundreds, oh, wow. hundreds of millions, if not. God, that's I, so I, hard for me to believe, Charles. Yeah, yeah, it's like a billion dollar brand. You know, they've made, those episodes are made, sh shown. You got to think about the, the scale of international. This is what Ben figured out early. And everyone else was like, oh my God, what were my ratings on Thursday? And he was like, I, I want to know what I did in the Philippines. Think about it. You make 10 episodes here, right, in America. And it used to be that's how you made your money. You get your fees and you got your residuals or whatever. And then, you know, there are 120 countries that will buy, 140 countries that will buy that tape. Let's say you only sell it for like a thousand dollars, and you got 120 countries. You're talk still talking, you know, 1.2 million dollars for that one episode, and you don't sell an episode for a thousand dollars. You sell an episode for a hundred thousand dollars. You know, whatever the budget licensing fee that is commensurate to that marketplace. So if they if their primetime shows cost them $100,000, then tape would cost them, you know, a, a portion of that, 20 grand. So they're like, okay, we get a primetime level show from America and we're going to pay $20,000 for the tape for that one episode, right? So you're making, you know, $2 million, $3 million on every episode and you could do 100 episodes, you know? And there's no incremental cost on that. That's just pure profit then on everything that goes global. Pure profit, yeah. And then what can happen, you know, I created a show... Uh, that Ben uh, helped sold, uh, sold to ABC uh, with Walmart. Um, um, I was part of so he, when you say with Walmart, he shows up with Walmart already on board. So what, yeah, well, that one was, so we came up with it. It was like uh, the company I was with at the time, 5x5 five five and, and Ben's uh, team came up with this show called Better Your Baby, which was a family <laughs> group show. And um, we sold it to ABC as a pilot. And then Ben, um, being the, you know, sort of the master that he is, brought in Walmart to get it to go straight to series. So it reduced the risk because he brought in deficit financing from Walmart to support the show. And then they also did an ad buy around the show, which makes it more appealing as well. Um, but that show, we did two seasons of that here. Um, but it was like the number one show in the Philippines and it still may be the number one show in the Philippines. I don't know. It was getting like 40% of the country was watching the show because they added celebrities over there and people love celebrities and babies, apparently. Um, <laughs> celebrities and babies. Oh my. Yeah. So there's just a really robust international market and people have figured that out. And so it's kind of becoming a more, um, stable market and negotiate pre-negotiated. You can't really, uh, get lucky, you know, in the way maybe in the early days you could. 
Um, but it's, um, you know, the people consume content voraciously right now. You know, it's voracious. You know, we can't make it fast enough. And there's a lot of us doing it. And there's a lot of buyers and the markets are shifting. But, but really, you know, I could spend six months on 10 episodes and they'll just get consumed like, you know, cotton candy. Well, not that our world is remotely comparable to your world, but, you know, in our little world of legends and losers, um, I had this huge aha, Charles, uh, a little while ago. <clears throat> we had this assumption that the way people consume podcasts in general, but th this one specifically was, they sort of look at the show and they look at who the guest is and what the topic is and they make a decision whether or not they're going to listen. And if they're subscribing to the show, you know, and they're at show, you know, 75 and we've just dropped show 85 that, you know, they're yeah. 10 shows behind, so to speak, that they would look at those 10 shows and go, okay, well, there's two or three or four, whatever it is that topics or people inter interest me and I'm going to uh, listen to those ones and then I'll be caught, quote unquote, caught up. And what they told us to your point on consuming content voraciously is that's not what they do. They consume every episode wow. because they view the show as I thought they viewed it as a, as a, as a bunch of episodes and they don't, they view it as an ongoing narrative, no different to, you know, house of cards. Yeah. And, and themes, certain themes maybe come up and, and correct. Yeah. And when we reference other shows, if they haven't heard those shows, they're like, oh, I got to hear that show. And so yeah. you're, even in our own little world, we've seen this thing where people want to, and the other thing they tell us is new uh, listeners to Legends and Losers binge the whole fucking thing up to current. That's and they'll bananas. like email us and go, oh, I just got caught up and I'm really bummed out. What's coming next, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so it's interesting that, you know, in the, and, and, you know, I'm not confused about legends and losers and you. Like, we play flag football and you play in the Super Bowl. I'm not, like, confused about, about any of that. that. Yeah. But, um, but it is interesting to see that you really feel like you create a legendary 10-episode uh, uh, product, if you'll allow me that. And, and yeah. like, people want the next 10 instantly. Yeah. It's, it's fun, you know. I've, I've made enough – uh, unsuccessful shows or shows that were good but didn't rate or shows that rated but weren't good you know to have seen different things and the funnest ride is when you've been working your tail off on something and usually you're still working on the show when it airs and when it's working and then you just all of a sudden you know more episodes are being ordered what are we doing season two it's really fun it's fun you know MTV just bought another 20 episodes of Fear Factor yeah, yeah. not a boy yeah. So it's, you know, going, it's a hundred miles an hour when it's working because a good show can prop up a whole network, you know, and they start to, they're all their ad uh, sales, uh, you know, can be floated by a show that's working well. So, um, so what's the difference, but you know, this is the billion dollar question that I've been dying ever since you and I got connected, Charles, to talk to yeah. you about, which is yeah. how do we create a fucking hit? How do we create content that is both, you know, something that, let's say, people with an IQ larger than their fucking shoe size say is content of value. It's not Kardashian selfies. Yeah. And, and at the same time is a gigantic hit. How do we do that? You know, there uh, are really universal things, I think, that people gravitate towards when they watch or consume content. Either things that make them feel something or makes them laugh or takes them away or shocks them and and there are very clear cycles, you know, and I think that that answer is different in any new sort of pop culture cycle. Right now in TV, we're seeing a very big appetite for um, crime, you know, uh, whether it's making a murderer or serial or S-Town or um, the keepers, there's, you know, there's, it and the old shows continue, right? I mean, we have, well, here's the thing. law and order, yeah. IUD, yeah, those are like, those are like, more, 20 those billion, are like, right? Those are like family members, right? They are, <laughs> they are, they're like, you love them. They're always there at Christmas. You like being, you know, it's a part of the way in which you relax, right? Like we love watching a law and order or for people who are obsessed with the bachelor, even though they know what's going to happen and every trope has been exposed and every, 
every you know contrite moment has been played out 30 times they enjoy it because there's a ritual to watching that you know and the shows like Surv in my world survivor bachelor uh, amazing race they have perfected the art of of um their brand and what they provide their audience member and they're very uh controlled about that they they got to freshen it they got to keep it exciting but at the same time they make it thing and then there's the novel right there's something that comes out of left field and you're just like oh my god what's that and you know um in our world like duck dynasty came out of nowhere and that launched a thousand rednecked ships <laughs> you know what i mean uh and then you you can have a show um like the kardashians that drive like that sort of social uh, you know um docu soap type storytelling so um no one can really predict it um to to you know to be fair to the creators of duck dynasty I, my kid played softball with uh scott uh, who um created that show with his wife and he said to me he goes he goes i got to show you this tape it was a sizzle tape and i was like what is it and he's like it's this company that makes duck whistles they're amazing and i'm like i think i was making <laughs> some giant thing at that time and i'm like duck whistles he's like yeah yeah you got to work on it i'm like no I, you know you know he's like no you don't understand these guys are gold and i was like oh okay you know and he was right you know he called that long ball and that show made hundreds of millions of dollars you know it was wow. a lot of money because the guys were compelling and it was it was a family comedy sitcom you know and really relatable characters so in that way not different from you know beverly hillbillies you know i mean really yeah. it's part of that it's part of that um throwback kind of storytelling of people who just say what they want and live the way they think they should live and aren't held to the same standards that they think people bullshit about, you know? So, so with that, you know, in category design, they always talk about being different instead of just better, but it sounds like you're, you're finding things from different mediums. Like, you know, if it's a overseas TV show and making it different for the U S market, well, I mean, how, how much do you focus on riding a wave that's, that's popular and trying to find the new, the next, you know, category yeah uh, it's a good question and i think you know it's so funny just brief aside i'm going to answer that i noticed on planet of the apps whenever uh, uh a fatal question was asked of a um app creator like the question you're like wait a second and you ask that question because you know there's something wrong with it they go that's a good question um <laughs> it was always it was i was like oh they're fucked um, uh, so whenever anybody says that's a good question, that's, they're well, that's paddling question. hard. That's huh? usually, you, you just know, like dig there because there's, you know, a skeleton there somewhere. That's a good um, question. I wish you didn't ask. Yeah. Yeah. So to answer that is there's two things about international in particular, uh, in terms of using someone else's IP, there's the sales aspect, which makes it easier because anytime an executive buys a show, they're risking an aspect of their job, right? Cause they only win by buying or passing on TV shows. They don't get necessarily get to make it, or if they do, it's still tangential to the actual showrunners. And so when you come and you say, this is a hit in England, and it's on season three, and we know that hits in England generally can be hits here, that executive can buy it, put a celebrity in it. And if it doesn't work, you're like, well, we all thought it was going to work. If they come and buy like a completely new concept that has no proven IP, it's a very big risk and you could lose your job. You know, Lloyd Braun bought Lost. It was one of the most expensive pilots at the time. It was a $12 million pilot. And J.J. Abrams was making like a big movie and there wasn't the support at ABC because it wasn't an approved storytelling model. You know, the sort of woven backstory and present story and this mystery that didn't have an end. And he actually lost his job over buying that show, even wow. though what became that show was you know culture changing so did they hire him back and give him a hundred million dollars when the thing took have. off <laughs> lloyd lloyd i think lloyd's done just fine yeah uh, i've never met him but uh he's certainly legendary in my business but you know and uh, interestingly you know you know that his voice is the previously on lost JJ, oh that's he's cool. already lost his job and i think i'm not sure if it's jj or damon lindelof or somebody um as i i've heard brought him in just as a kind of you know to give him a nod to the show, but that was always his voice. <laughs> um, well, like I wonder about you guys, like, um, you know, of course it was always fun watching Hitchcock movies because you, you were watching for Alfred to like walk by as people got on oh the bus God. or something, right? I, I do that. I put myself in my show. Do you, are you like oh a, 
What I do you like to do is in your, in your oh, productions? Uh, I always, I've been shot in the chest. We did an action adventure uh, thing with Justin Timberlake called The Phone. And, um, you know, basically people were thrust into a movie. They didn't know what was going on. And I got, I was a cop and I, I had a blood pack and I got shot by a sniper right in front of them. Um, I played, uh, Jamie Oliver got stuck uh, at an airport and we needed to shoot just a piece to show that like he was late um, at the airport in West Virginia. And so I basically just at, put through on a, an airline jacket and was like taking tickets. I just do it. I, don't know, I like to do it. It's just for my mom. So you're getting your Hitchcock on. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, uh, you know, I wish so. Well, I do think it's fun that you're injecting yourself. Yeah. Now, how do you think, Charles, about marketing content today? How, how do you think about, you well, know, you go and you do the reboot of Fear Factor. How do you think about making sure in a world of exploding content, it's, the world knows and, and it, comes to the show? It's the number one challenge uh, for anything we do. Uh, I remember I did a, a show for a network and I was really concerned about what they wanted to do for the first 10 minutes. And I'm like, we got to, you know, we got to change this. It's too slow. It's too much exposition. We got to get to it. It's going to, and I was really advocating really hard. And she said, you just need to worry about people coming to see the show. And I'm like, no, my job is to make them stay. You got to get them to the show. <laughs> you know what I mean? So my, I don't know. You know, it's your market. Um, the thing about it is that networks are now focusing on buying stuff that self markets itself. The fear factor self markets itself. Ludicrous as the host allowed uh, a very quick messaging that this was um, a different type of fear factor. You know, they were, they were um, interested in the urban market and uh, Chris had a very, you know, has a high Q score. People really like him. And between the, the, the show itself, and sort of a nostalgia factor of the show and, and him, it's, it, you know, they definitely marketed it, but most buyers now are looking for packages that self market when they come in, you know, what does self market mean in your world? Well, you know, they have, you know, in, you know, in the obvious thing they've got, they've got, you know, that either the talent or the brand itself has reach, right? Like some people like, you know, package influencers because they've got reach. Although we've seen that there's not a lot of crossover between, online influencers and traditional viewing. Um, they don't drag their audiences generally. So if you do an influencer campaign on Instagram uh, for American Gladiator or another one of your shows, yeah. even with a person with many millions of followers on Instagram, it doesn't translate? If it's a campaign that's more like a marketing spend that's targeted and data-driven, I would say probably. I don't think I've ever seen specific feedback about that. But I'm saying like a lot of times, at least in the early days of like really big YouTube influencers, they would bring an influencer uh, in thinking that he would just automatically drag his 3 million followers. And if you get 3 million viewers, you're like psyched. And that generally hasn't happened. And that's why you haven't seen a lot of breakouts of YouTube stars on TV. You know? And that's even in the same medium of video to video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of times the content's not that different. You know, if the show's really branded to that person. I think Dude Perfect, uh, the guys who do all the trick shots, um, mm -hmm. I think their sh their kid show is doing quite well. Um, you know, PewDiePie did a big thing for Re uh, YouTube Red called Scare PewDiePie, and that didn't work, I don't think. It didn't work. <clears throat> no. And um, correct so me if I'm wrong, but there's kind of not that many people, if any, that are bigger on YouTube than PewDiePie. Is that right? Or am I? Yeah, he saying? certainly seems he certainly seems like one of the big guys until his little controversy. Or big controversy. Yeah, um, he's in a lot of trouble, isn't he? Yeah. And in terms of, I'd be curious, you know, I have to ask as a podcaster, so with the reboot of Fear Factor and the fact that, you know, uh, Joe Rogan says that he gets the 5 million, 8 million downloads an episode. Yep. And, you know, what does a good primetime TV show get in terms of a Nielsen rating number of people? Well, there are two numbers that we pay attention to. It's one's total viewership, which is less important than uh, the demo. And the demo is 18 to 54 or 18 to 49, depending. Um, and, uh, or 18 to 25, if you're like a, you know, youth uh, skewing network. So, um, and, and you, you know, so, so you've got the demo. Um, uh, a show like Game of Thrones would be 10, 12 million viewers. Um, in the demo, 
Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. I think that's got an older viewing audience generally. Um, but they don't, um, it's not like they're blowing YouTube views out. You know, YouTube is, YouTube's crushing and certainly podcasts and people who have very large followings see huge numbers of followers and they're being rewarded for it. YouTubers yeah. are you know, making a fortune because they have those very real engaged audiences. Um, but I guess you know, yeah, was a, on, the, on the Rogan comment, one, yeah. was there ever any discussion vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Fear Factor? <sighs> well, shit, you know, obviously he's the original host. He's got 5 million downloads, 8 million downloads per episode of a fucking podcast. He smokes pot and talks about fights and comedy yeah. and 8 million people tune in. And do you guys look at that and go, well, shit, we're, we're mental if we don't bring him back? Um, or does I mean, that not gotta, influence you at all, the 8 million views? I mean, the thing about Fear Factor that was unique was that it was MTV's uh, flagship new show under the new regime at MTV. And MTV traditionally is a female skewing teenage network, 13 to 18, 23 on the outside. It's got one of the hardest uh, markets to chase because it's always the new market. It's always the preteen teenager market and it's always fresh and they got to be way ahead of it. And Chris McCarthy's, you know, and I would give it, you know, his stroke of genius was that the kids that watched Fear Factor watched with their parents 10, 10 15 years ago. And so there was a nostalgia, let's say 10 years ago, there was a nostalgia of the family watching Fear Factor uh, and the co-viewing aspect of it that he, he's a very quant driven executive and he saw an opportunity to go back and he's doing that rebooting a few things like parental control and I wouldn't be surprised if some other famous old MTV brands came back or just brands in general. Yeah. Uh, it's the same problem though. He wants to own as well. So Fear Factor is not owned by MTV. It's licensed. So I know they're also looking for original formats. And then, you know, as someone who grew up in the tech industry, the other thing I'm dying to ask you is, as you think about this new world with Apple and Amazon and Netflix at the forefront, um, how do you see things playing out as, as those guys vie to be the category king and I don't know, you tell me what you want to call it, digital, original content, and then, you know, MTV and, of course, the traditional network, CBS and NBC. And how, how, how does this sort of emerging cage match between sort of the new guys and the old guy, you know, who wins with the new guys and what does that mean for the old guys? And how do you, how do you think about that stuff, Charles? Um, I mean, the thing about these new players and these deep pockets is that content is getting, I mean, the, 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 the shows that have come out in the last five, 10, seven years because of Netflix and the deep, they're spending $8 billion next year. Them alone. Netflix is. Netflix alone is spending $8 billion. Apple's talks about spending a billion. The big networks are spending in the billions. The amount of money that is vying for uh, the consumer's eyeballs is is never been higher. So I, I think it's it's exciting time because you can sell a giant show to Apple and they'll let you make your show. You can sell a more outlandish concept that is very niche focused because Netflix wants to build that subscription base in that niche. You know, they're like, we need, you know, they're very, they're all data driven, right? They're like, we need, we don't have any of these types of viewers. They weren't doing any unscripted stuff. And then last year or in the last 12 months, they bought 30 shows. And like all of a sudden everybody's making shows for Netflix because they were like, okay, we got to go after this category now. So um, I think that's going to continue. There's always talk about the, um, there's always talk about, you know, the way movies went, you know, sort of you, you had the 10, 5, 10, 15, 20, $30 million movies. And now it's like 150 or 3 million or 5 million, like the Blumhouse movies and the middles dropped out. Um, and that's where a lot of the so you're either creating a giant movie or a teeny movie. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I, I always thought that's where reality and unscripted stuff was going as well. And even, you know, even premium scripted, but there's so much money in the market now that the middle still exists. But I think when you are really only able to monetize your product by getting a massive amount of audience, the, the desire and the need to take bigger swings that are more able to muscle their way through the marketplace because of, of the spend, and the spend can be like, it's a giant spend on the production, like Game of Thrones. It could be huge talent that's never done TV. It could be a massive marketing budget, which we don't see much of these days. Um, so it's, it's very, it, everything's shifting, you know, in that sense. It's going, it's fun though, you know, like seven years ago, 
you know, think besides Lost, maybe seven, eight, ten years ago, there was no great scripted stuff being. It was just the procedurals on the cables, and the, you know, we were making a ton of big formats. Yeah, um, shit feels very different today, doesn't it? Well, yeah, like you wouldn't catch a celebrity on TV. Like you know, they would be, they would kill their career if any major movie celebrity went on any scripted, unscripted, anything on TV, you know, and to Ben's credit, he got the rock on, on one of our shows, which was, you know, a never before seen level of attachment for a TV show of ours. And, and is uh, Dwayne the Rock Johnson the coolest guy in America right now? You know what, you know, there, there are celebrities who uh, are nothing like their brands and then there are ones who are exactly, and he is one genuinely of the nicest, Hardest work. You know, we were making this little tiny show in Florida. It was like a transformation show because he wanted to help and give back to the community he grew up in. And, you know, this guy had over a billion dollars in box office that year. And he would show up like an hour before we would shoot. He would sit. He would talk to us about whoever we're going to go talk to. And he would work all day. He would work out like a crazy person. And he's surrounded by his family. His ex-wife is his manager. His brother-in-law is his, his ex-wife. His ex-wife is his manager. His ex-wife is his manager. His uh, ex-brother-in-law is his producing partner. His security is his nephew. His stunt uh, double is his cousin. Um, he's surrounded by family, and I think that's why he's so well-respected in, in the industry. He's genuinely just like you'd imagine. Hmm. That's like, so cool. Yeah, the nicest guy. And it's funny, when you pitch him ideas, he would go, he would go, uh. Oh. You, know, you can imagine the wrong. He would go, uh. Oh. And then he'd go, He'd look over at Hiram or um, one of his writers and go, what do you think of that? And that was their cue to go, yeah, I don't know about that, right? <laughs> and I remember once I pitched something crazy to him and he was like, huh. And he looked over to, over to what was his name? Was his writer. He looked over and he goes, what do you think? And then he goes, I think that's a good idea. And I looked at him like, are you crazy? Don't you know that means you don't like it? <laughs> uh, so, um, but he's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. Yeah. Very cool. I hope I get to make something with him again. Well, I hope we get to see something that you make with him again. <laughs> yeah. And if we could just shift a little bit, Charles, um, how do you get to be you? I mean, you have a job, you have a life, particularly in America where everybody's obsessed with, you know, celebutards and Hollywood and, and you know, even in, in Silicon Valley now, of course, yeah. you know, we don't live that far from uh, the Netflix headquarters and there's like, all this construction going on. And so, you know, look, Facebook hasn't figured out they're a media company yet. Sheryl Sandberg's still telling everybody they're a technology company, but they're a fucking media company. And so, anyway, I, I, wherever you come at it from, whether it's technology or, if you will, a more traditional uh, media content creator background, there's a lot of little kids who say, when I grow up, mommy, I want to make TV shows and movies and awesome shit. And you, you made that happen. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I mentor a lot of, I was mentored and I mentor a lot of people coming into the industry. So I kind of have a take on that. Uh, and um, the thing about what I do, right? We've talked about fear factor, which is explosions and cars flipping and people's safety. And then we've talked about the rock who's like big celebrity managing that and then the business. And there's so many different unique um, things that you need to sort of learn and there's no school that teaches it to you, right? Like in scripted, if you're just a straight scripted guy, right? You could walk onto a set with a great script that you've written and maybe a great short or, or you know, and they, be, they could give you a big movie. Like the guy who directed uh, Jurassic World that did hundreds of millions of dollars, he made one $900,000 movie because he was a great director and did a good job. Um, and in my world, in our world, that doesn't exist because it has been built on a, it is a shanty on top of a floppy house. And it's the, the systems that we use and the logic we go about selling and making and doing safety and insurance and creative. It's also um, kind of hobnob together. And now it's kind of formalized into a mature industry, but certainly when I started 15, 16 years ago, we were just figuring it out on the fly. Um, and it's a sort of still an apprenticeship is what I'm trying to say. Like you basically started the bottom. I went to good schools, you know, and I had sort of. Family. You studied film, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I was, uh, I went to Yale and I studied English and then I went to NYU grad film. 
Those are good schools. They're good schools, but you know Very what it got me? Schools. You know what it got me? Fetching coffee for a year. You know, like you gen, there's no shortcuts. You know, and if you know, if you start, but did, at the bottom, it, but did it help you at all, Charles, to even get the coffee fetching jobs? <laughs> uh, like what was the coffee. value of all that shit? The your education. Uh, I think that there is a shorthand of he'll figure it out. That you know, I think that, that there's sort of. Uh, a less of a question mark, you know, like it doesn't necessarily get you the jobs, but if you get the job, they're like, all right, well, he'll figure it out if you can, mm. you know, so I imagine that a long time I wouldn't tell anybody because reality was, you know, in the early days, like verboten, you know what I mean? Nowadays it's, you know, the, the media universe is so wide and varied. It's not like it was, but you know, in the first five, 10 years of reality, I pivoted away from scripted TV, um, scripted, uh, because I saw where, uh, unscripted was going and it was a growth industry and um i didn't tell people you know they're like they found out like at the end of the show they're like you went to yale and then they would say why are you doing this you know <laughs> <laughs> they would always say that um but i you know to answer your first question really it's um it's about uh you just you start at the top and you create these networks of relationships and learning and i would always say to people starting out you know, the way everyone's trying to move up this ladder, it's a classic apprenticeship, but rather than you're in a, rather than being a corporation, which has created your ladder, your ladder is created by the network that you're able to create around you. And that is the network of people you work with and the shows you work on or the companies and studios you work with. And so it is a networked, it's a networked work environment where you're only as good as the nodes and the relationships you have and how well you feed them and how well you do on the projects you share. Um, and, but, and then you also need to know that everyone's trying to move up as well when you start at the bottom. So one thing I always worked hard to do is figure out what my boss, my immediate boss's job and do that job for them without taking any credit. Like just kill yourself, do your job and do your boss's job. And then that would allow them to do their job, the, their boss's job and thereby allowing them to be promoted, which would drag you up the ladder as well. You know, and if you're lucky, you do, two or three or four um, jobs at a given credit level and then you'd move up. So, you know, it's not impossible to get into it. You know, it, people aren't clamoring quite so hard to get into what I do. I think, you know, it's not as glamorous as Game of Thrones or a big sitcom or, you know, big scripted TVs and movies. And most people don't come out here. It's a rare person that comes out here to get right into what I do, but we make so much TV that oftentimes we get really talented, interesting people as well. Yeah. And I, I love what you're talking about with your network. The other way I often think about it is, and I'd be curious if you think about it this way, Charles, it's, a, it's a network and it's an ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. And so you live where you live in the ecosystem and you don't, you have to mobilize an ecosystem to get a job done and, and then, or to get it approved or signed or bought or whatever, however you think about it. And then you have to mobilize a network ecosystem to actually go do it, right? They're the, from the set builders to the actors and everybody in between, yes? Yeah, and a lot of times when you get hired, as you move closer to the top and become a showrunner, or a lot of time you're being hired not only because you can execute on a, on a logistical basis or on a creative basis, but a lot of times when you hire a guy like Matt Kunitz who created the first Fear Factor, you're getting his ecosystem. You're getting the line producers that know how to talk to the union. You're getting the EICs that understand the insurance, this particular insurance requirements of a show like that. You're getting the story producers who know how to do the right kind of interviews to support a show like that. And the editors who know how to cut well. So a lot of times as you move up and become sort of a showrunner, you're sort of shepherding that kind of little world or, or fronting that you can, you know, whether or not you have it or not in your pocket. And Charles, did you know 15 years ago as you were starting out that you needed to build this network ecosystem so that one day when you became the master of the universe that we now know? I'm not. <laughs> trust me, there's much bigger people than me. Um, <laughs> well, that's um, always true, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think uh, it's organic to just try to get a job. You know what I mean? You're just on set and you're out of work in two days or you're you know, working on a show and you're like, what's next? And, you know, you're trying to do a good job. Your reputation is only as good as the last job. And sometimes you, you know, if I look back, have I hit a hundred percent on every job? Maybe, maybe not, probably not. You know, I think that you really try to, and it's organic 
uh, it's organic and then sort of becomes really formal in a way. You grow up with people too, right? Like my friends are running networks now, you know, yes. and I'm like, hmm. and there's a history, you know, TV shows are like trial by fire. If you're in the swamps, you're literally on the top of skyscrapers, there's helicopters and, and there's money and anger. And, you know, I perfectly <laughs> argue most of my job is arguing. And then, um, uh, you grow up, you know? And so my friends are working at the networks now. A great friend of mine just went to one of the big broadcasters and I'm like, we got to make something, you know? So, you know, it's so interesting you say that. I remember when I was in my early thirties, I was running marketing for an internet, um, consulting company called Scient. And our CEO, Bob Howe is just, he's an amazing guy, incredible guy. Um, and he, and we had a lot of young people in the company and his Rolodex of CEOs was like, they took a horse, it was incredible. And so he would tell all of us, he would say, well, you know, I, I didn't start off with a Rolodex of CEOs. That's not what happened. Yeah. What happened was when I was in my 20s and 30s, yeah. I identified other folks I thought were superstars. Yeah. And those superstars are now CEOs. Yeah. Yeah. But it's yeah. an interesting thing. If somebody, uh, it was a very valuable lesson for me. It wasn't necessarily something I was doing, but at the time, he opened my eyes to pay attention to, okay, where are the 25 to 35 year old superstars in my world? And you know, I'm a 49 year old dude now. And guess what? All those 30 year old rock stars, yep. they're running big important shit today. And I got a network that, you know, of CEOs and other big super ding dong people yeah. in technology that we took a soul horse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I see that with Ben and Howard, you know, they're, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about a show idea and, you know, he'd be like, oh, that'd be perfect for 23 and Me," And then he'll call, you know, the CEO, like just pick up the phone. And you're like, what? You just called the CEO? I was going to like call the help desk. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and I like, like how you said when somebody says yes to you, they're saying yes to your whole network and ecosystem. Because it's not only you're the man that knows how to do it, but you're the person that knows the people to know, get yeah, how to do it. You know, um, and it's tough. You know, it's... Uh, it's a, um, there's, it's high risk. You know, every show we make, you know, if you raise $3 million for an app development company, that's a pretty good start, right? You're like, I raised a million bucks. I raised 2 million. I raised 3 million. You know, our smallest shows start at 3 million and go all the way up to 35 million, you know, um, and in my world. And, and that's just one TV show, you know, that you're like, Oh, you made that show. It was a really nice show. I like that show. You know, it's, it's, uh, it just shows you the, the, the risk that comes in who you hire and, and what you do. And so a lot of times networks are risk adverse. And if you've made Fear Factor before, you make Fear Factor again, if you've made this show. And I've been sort of careful to kind of make sure I've made, I've made long form documentaries. I've made stunt shows. I've made comedies. I, I've tried to mix it up so I don't, you don't end up in, in an eddy that, of the industry that no one wants, right? Because that can happen in entertainment. Be like, oh, you're a game show guy. No one's making game shows and you're out of business. But also, isn't it hard to position yourself effectively when you're known for this as opposed to a tighter niche? Yeah, yes. And I would say that um, there's, you know, there can still be a buck, there's still a bigger brand bucket you can live in. Like I've been lucky to make a lot of network primetime sort of shinier shows that are format. So um, I would probably say I kind of edge towards the more bigger primetime non scripted. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated, but you know, really when people look at your resumes, they're looking for the right type of experience. And I've made 30 TV shows, so you can kind of cobble together the experience that you want to sell on any particular thing. Well, it's weird now, like I'm actually selling shows as much as I'm trying to make the shows. So um, that's a transition to have my own company. So what's that like when you have to both sell them and make them? Uh, well, you know, uh, the key, I think, and I've yet to, uh, get there cause I've just launched the company. The key is, is that you are producing a company and not producing a show. Right. So I sold a show actually in one of my first pitches and they were like, are you going to show run? And usually my instinct's like, yeah, of course I can't wait to make the show. Um, and I said no. And they said, oh, good. Cause they knew that I'm a company. Right. And so that was a really watershed moment where um, I could bring in a really interesting, talented person to make the show. And 
Um, and I still have just as much stress and responsibility, <laughs> that show, but, but I'm not necessarily the day-to-day -day person. So the main, the main thing is, is to really focus on sales. It is a sales business. You're only as good as your last show and the burn is very high. And, the um, you know, that's why I partners were partnered with Ben and Howard as well, uh, as opposed to maybe other content like people like me, I, I focused on them because there's nobody better at packaging and understanding the marketplace and, um, and selling. So with your new company, I mean, what's your vision for it? And why did you make the jump to, to start your own show? Um, well, I've worked on shows that have made hundreds of millions of dollars um, to the rights owners. So that uh, certainly is the long ball. Right, but I'm not really in it to be a lottery winner on creating the next Fear Factor, or Duck Dynasty, or Extreme Home Makeover. It would be lovely, trust me. And I often think like, maybe I'll just get lucky, right? <laughs> Make a show and it's the show. Um, but I- um, What if we did like Oprah meets Duck Dynasty? Oprah Dynasty, yeah, she's a dynasty. <laughs> yeah. uh, Duck uh, Oprah, maybe. Yeah, Oprah, yeah. Well, there's something, in, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the- uh, um, I, I like that, you know, it's probably why Jason suggested I do talk to you guys just because I enjoy the business side of it. I'm interested in the convergence of content and distribution, you know, and the new business models. And I like, uh, I love creating shows. And when I'm a showrunner, I get hired, I show up in my box, I work six, eight months, I make the show. And then, you know, I'm either going to make another season of it or I go off and do something else. And, um, creating shows about creating brands and monetizing those, those IP, um, you know, and, and, and they're, they're more complex problems. And I think that there's a lot more upside than just being paid a check to be creative, you know, and also like when I'm 50 and 60, you know, I, I you know, I know enough of a business. I want to be passively, you know, I want to be a passive income, you know, person and not, not having to be on set 14 hours to, to make a paycheck. So, um, but I find the business aspect interesting. Ultimately, I just like it. You know, I like figuring it out. Very cool. Yeah. So Charles, um, anything else before we kick out of this wave? Well, I'm going to watch more of the podcast cause you guys are awesome. <laughs> Thank um, you. Uh, you know, I'd love to come back in a year or two and see what happened to all this Netflix and Apple buying and stuff like that. Or three years when you're on episode 3000, we could do a, a reboot you know the industry hey you, you have an open invitation legends and losers is your podcast <laughs> whenever you're doing anything that you think is cool and you want to come share with the world yeah. come share it with our world well i think the big question mark you know is what you know where content who's going to be making the content and how are we going to be consuming it because it is like we i think we're going to see entire industries crater and we're going to see big billion dollar brands blow up trying to do this their own way and it's going to be interesting so, you know, in that regard, the thing that blows me away is, you know, uh, a couple of guys with a couple of laptops can do this now. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're nowhere near Tim Ferriss or, or Rogan or, or Corolla's numbers, but, you know, we're off to the races and, and doing great. And it just blows my mind that for kind of not that much money, uh, you could at least launch, you know, uh, I wouldn't call us a radio show because I don't I don't like that idea. But you know, in this new format and be and be worldwide and and, yeah. and and have fans from Australia to I got email two days ago from some folks in in, in Africa who are addicted to Legends and Losers. It's just craziness, right? So yeah. that is a very interesting dynamic as the as the barrier. And we've seen the same thing in software, frankly, right? It used to be if you wanted to start a software company, you'd buy Sun servers and databases and you know, dev tools and all this shit, which, you know, you plug into AWS and you know, away you go. And, you know, the three of us can, as you well know, having, having done what you did for Apple, you know, it doesn't yeah. take that much. And so the influence of that over time um, is a very fascinating thing um, to watch. And then, you know, I don't know about you, but I never saw uh, a day uh, 20 years ago where, where Apple would be hiring Charles to, to do uh, show? Uh, yeah, 10 said. years ago, I didn't see it. Even when we were making it, uh, I felt that way. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, no uh, I, I agree. It's, it's, uh, it's a crazy world. I mean, Apple's spending a billion, right? But like, think about how much cash they have on hand. I mean, literally, Apple could replace the entire content market and fund it all. And still, it's a rounding error, you know? 
And of course, that applies. I haven't to- looked recently. Do you know what their cash position is, Charles? I know at one uh, point it was over three hundred. Yeah, like two, yeah, two three hundred million. You know, yeah. probably more now. I don't know, but you know, um, yeah, I don't know. You know, the other thing about content is you can't just throw money at it, right? You need engaging, fun ideas. I think you know. I hear my prediction for content. Yeah, and I'm developing a little bit, and I don't know uh, when, and I, it might be three years from now, and it was totally moot, but. We're in the crime phase right now and crime's crushed and then crime goes away. People get sick of the sadness of it, right? But they're like, we're watching Mindhunter and we're watching all these crime things. And right now, nowhere, there's, ro- there's no romance. And romance is as evergreen as crime, as comedy, as children, as you know, uh, talents, right? They're evergreen things that we love seeing. We love seeing people win and their dreams. We love seeing crime and seeing the things in life that scare us. And, there's no romance. So my prediction to Legends and Losers is in the next one to three years, people are gonna, the romance is gonna be back. Because if you're, the only thing you've gotten right now is Bachelor and romance has always worked since the dawn of TV, so. Well, that is, I wanna will it, I wanna will it, because I'm ready that, for it. That is a great way to get invited back on in three years to find out if you were a legend in the prediction or a loser in the prediction yeah, and to yeah. make the next one. Yeah, you'll ask hey, fuck, come would... back in three months and tell us about it. We don't have to yeah. wait that long. Uh, I'm going to go try and sell some romance, some shows that, are, that have good sweethearts and make you feel good about being in love, and we'll see if I get any luck. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring this up because um, he's going to kill me. He's obviously going to kill me, but fuck him. So our producer, Matt Johnson, is a young, is a, a young single dude. Yeah. And, you know, he's on Flinder and Vinder and all these fucking things, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's really working for him. And when I was, I, I haven't been single for much of my adult life, but the window that I was single in was sort of the very beginning of all that shit. Match.com was available and, and, a, few, yeah. and a few others. But here's the thing that strikes me. Uh, it's very dehumanizing with this swipe left, swipe right business, shopping at the, at the, you know, woman's store or the men's store, depending on your persuasion. Yeah. And so I think you, I don't, I don't know, know shit about your business, Charles. So whatever, anything I say is not worth anything, but, but it is interesting because in a world of all this swipe, right, swipe, swipe left bullshit, like real romance, real human connection, yeah. uh, a rehumanizing of the dating experience, the relationship experience. That's an interesting topic to me in a Flinder Bender yeah. Twinder world. Yeah, I, I feel like it's early still. Like if I had to think, it feels like people are still kind of in the panic of the Trump w- era where there's a very, um, you know, we feel very disconnected from a lot of traditional understandings of like how America works. And I think until we kind of process the new media world that we live in and alternate facts and I think that there's just a lot of anxiety. And I think once the anxiety starts to calm down, you know, and that may, that may be seven years, it may be three years, it may be the midterm elections, it may have nothing to do with Trump, but there's a lot of anxiety. And I do think people won't want to necessarily watch that until that starts to calm down. But, hmm. you know, I think it's, I think it's necessary, you know, social disconnection is like the plague that you know, as a dad, I'm trying to avoid, like I've slowed down our whole life. I've just moved to, like the mountains essentially just to kind of disconnect from that increasingly anxious treadmill that it feels like everybody's on, you know? So well, and to that point, it, look, I'm going to ask you for a little free consulting here again. You can kick me under yeah. the table. You know, we've put all of our chips at legends and losers on this thing we call, you know, authentic dialogue. Yep. Soaked in some whiskey. And, and, and the theory goes like this in a world of fucking emojis and stupid memes and, and Kardashian fucking selfie books. For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. And that what people now want in this fake world is authenticity. They want to hear real conversations with real people. Yeah. Conversations fucking matter. Dialogue fucking matters. We're not an yeah. interview show. I don't have a fucking script. I'm not a goddamn journalist. You know, I want to hang out with you and my buddy Tom and, and get to know you and learn from you. And so forth. And um, people can have a eavesdropping experience. We forget there's any kind of an audience and we just have a conversation and, and we let them do what they want with that conversation. We don't edit the fucking thing, you know, unless there's some technical problems or a few little things here and there. But there's no we do no fucking packaging 
on purpose, yeah. right? And so we've tilted really hard well, the opposite of Fortune yeah. Magazine or a lot of these podcasts where these, hi, welcome today, and we're going to, what are this, Charles, what are the three tips for the, you know, all that bullshit. Yeah. I think there's a segment of the world that hates that and just wants, yeah. am, am I off on, are we off no, on? No, here? So, so there's two things. You do have a brand and you are very well packaged and your brand is authentic dialogues that are unfiltered and unedited and raw. Right. So that like, I would say that like, that's an amazing, I think a, it's a great premise and that's why, you know, I was excited to talk to you. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that that, that is, I think people are, you know, really excited about that because, you know, like I, I realized with the internet, right. I just skimmed through skim and, sure. it, and, and I would realize hours would pass and I'd have no depth of meaningful thought or thing. And, and not so much from other people, but even like my own sort of internal life was just this like constant dipping in and looking for little like sugar drops. And uh, I've done better now. I listen to you guys. I listen to, you know, uh, books, you know, that like forced me to go deeper and a little bit more thing. But I think what you're doing is great. And, you know, I think that should be out front. You know, I know it is out front of your brand, but that's like, that is like the cell. The cell is that uh, you get to peek into unique worlds and mind views that don't necessarily get exposed on regular you know, half page web pages. I mean, think about how shallow the stuff we read online is. Even the New York Times now is just all biteized and headlined. You know, you read it and you're like, you can't, you don't even know where to go with it, you know? And then you try and read some long form stuff and you're just like, I can't read this. It's just, it's just, uh, you know, it's just, I don't like reading online so much, you know? So, Charles? Yes. Is it wrong for one man to love another man he just met? <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I, I can't tell you what it means to hear you say that because uh, we had no idea if this was going to work. I was completely terrified. We launched our first show on a Thursday in February of 2017. Yeah. That Tuesday night, there wasn't enough scotch and pot in Santa Cruz to calm my ass down. I thought people are going to laugh at me. This is ridiculous. Like, I was terrified. And so... Yeah. You know, to, and look, we've had great success and I'm really stoked about that. But to hear you say what you said about what you just said. Yeah. Fuck it, A, dude. Thank you so well, much. Well, I, I appreciate it. You know, I mean, I, uh, you know, I mean, it's, you know, I make a lot of TV that's consumed like while people are, you know, going to the bathroom and eating <laughs> lunch, you know, so uh, I'm not maybe totally typical, but I certainly appreciate, you know the format. Well, thank you. And uh, I want you to know, Charles, yep. Legends and Losers is your podcast. I'm going to come back. I want to come back and I want to answer three things. You ready? Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to turn this into a, you know, a, like a zippy podcast. Let's get zippy. Is, ro is romance coming back? Will the big players succeed and crush the old players or will they converge and who's going to live and who's going to die? Will Apple make it in the content business? Will the NBCs and CBSs of the world be able to compete with the big money, big pocket players who let creators do their thing? And more importantly, will my business be successful? Because I don't know. I hope so. I've got Ben on my side. So those are the three things. Romance, the players, and I am in week five of a new business. And as soon as you decide it's time to come back and talk about that, it's time to come back and talk about that. <laughs> right, I will check if you have any other new ideas in between now and then, then let, let us know and come back and talk right. about those. All right. Appreciate Charles, it. Thanks. You're Tom. awesome. You're handsome. Yeah. And, uh, you know, keep creating exciting content. And uh, yeah. thank you so much. Likewise. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Charles. All right, guys. Whew. You know, the amazing thing about Charles, if you think about the kind of life that guy's having, he could be the most arrogant, uh, pain in the ass to be around, you know, shithead you could imagine. Um, and he's the opposite. <laughs> right. And so it, it's the reason I find that interesting is, is, um, people who have the kinds of lives that this guy's having could get away with a lot of bad behavior. 
Um, and we've heard a ton of that in the press recently, but I didn't mean that kind of bad behavior. Um, they could just be assholes because uh, they're so successful, people tolerate their assholeness, right? Um, and so I find it fascinating when somebody who's achieved as much as a guy like Charles has in the kind of time frames he's done it in um, is so open, is so fun, is, is, it does not, you know what it is? I made a decision a long time ago that I really only wanted to spend time with people who had gotten over themselves. That is to say, don't take themselves too seriously. They might take their work seriously and their family and all that, but they don't take themselves seriously. And so, uh, you know, I guess all that is to say, I'm just trying to thank Charles one more time for being that way. And, um, and thank you for hanging out. If you love this episode as much as I clearly did, why not share it on social media right now? And, um, and why not uh, email it to some of your friends who, uh, who you think would uh, get some real value out of this, like uh, I, I know I sure did. All right. We would like to thank HarperCollins Instant Classic Play Bigger, how pirates, dreamers, and innovators create and dominate markets. PursuingResults.com, producers of legendary podcasts, and this one too. <laughs> Equity Directory. If you're in the startup ecosystem, you want to join Equity Directory. It is the place where legendary startups can connect with legendary talent and uh, swap talent uh, and check out resources and <laughs> do it all in a highly equitable way. <laughs> Colin's going to kill me. EquityDirectory.co. NetSuite.com. Check us out. NetSuite is the number one player in cloud ERP. If you're a growing business, NetSuite's the platform for you. One Life fullylive.org. We're the nonprofit that helps you dream, plan, and live your best life. Interviewvalet.com, Tom Schwab's company. If you're a thought leader, get your leading thoughts on podcasts. They do all the work for you. All you do is be the guest at interviewvalet.com. Uh, Stop Riding the Pine, an awesome podcast from our good friend and guest, uh, Jamie J and the World Wildlife Fund because we only have one planet. Check them out, WWF.org. All right, we must remind you that this podcast is the sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared the shit out of it right now. All rights do remain disturbed. We must uh, warn you this podcast was clearly produced in a uh, studio that does contain nuts. Legends and Losers may also contain forward looking statements, backward looking statements, and completely asinine statements. Watch Fear Fact. Factor. Future events could dif differ materially. Be nice to your sister. Thank a firefighter. Hands up, chin down. Be a podcast legend. Introduce two people you love to two podcasts you love. And hey, if you haven't changed your mind, if you haven't changed your mind lately, how do you know you have one? <laughs> All right, thank you, Candy Dandy. I love you, mom and dad. And uh, hey, Colin, this podcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go to Harvey Weinstein. Sorry, Harv, we just ran out of time for you. That's it. Thank you for investing part of your life with us. We hope to see you again soon on another episode of Legends and Losers.